every currency is fiat. Every currency is suppressing interest rates for 10, 15 years now. And every currency is in trouble. So there's no fiat currency. You can say, oh, I'm just going to sell my dollars and buy Swiss francs, or I'm going to sell my dollars and buy American dollars. It's like none of that. I mean, it might work in the short term, but long term, every everyone's headed to the same place, zero. So um, that's why we need something like Bitcoin. It's why we need stuff like gold. But I still think Bitcoin has this they each bring different things to the equation, but what I like about Bitcoin is just that that um, portability, right? I can just remember twelve words. Right? That's fine. If, I, yeah, if totally. I can get out of, uh, if I can get out of, like, let's say um, everything is like all bets off, like uh, just civil order collapses, boots on the ground, I, I just have to get out of here with the with my skin intact and the clothes on my back. I can go someplace else. Plug in my 12 words. Okay. Mark, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for your time. <laughs> Great to um, be here. Mark, uh, yeah, it seems uh, we um, somehow, yeah, I mean, as you told me, I've, I've been like following you since, uh, because I haven't been on Medium, uh, where I used to write some, you know, some of my blog articles about the Bank of International Settlements, you know, it's sort of a deep rabbit hole of its own. Um, uh, but maybe we can talk about that a little bit later. Um, but it, uh, you know, then I listened to that interview recently, that amazing interview with uh, Whitney Webb. And oh yeah, yeah. And you seem to be in charge, or you're, you're sort of producing the audio uh, version of her uh, double volume book, uh, "One Nation Under Blackmail." Why don't you please introduce yourself a little bit to me, uh, because I don't know much sure. about you. I know you're an investor, entrepreneur. You're uh, you seem to be a pretty you know hardcore Bitcoin maxi, but you know I don't want to <laughs> put you into any kind of you know category. But thanks so much again. Go ahead. Yeah, sure. I mean, Bitcoin Maxi is more accurate than it was in the past, but uh, yeah, I'll just briefly go through. So my my name is Mark Jeftovic. I'm based in Toronto, Canada. Uh, my main gig is I co-founded a company called Easy DNS back in 98. Uh, it was a managed DNS provider, uh, then became a domain registrar when ICANN sort of opened the field to competition. Uh, we started as a reseller for two cows, then became directly accredited. We became directly accredited for CA, uh, .ca in 2002, I think it was. Um, so I've been in naming for most of my career. And uh, I got into Bitcoin around 2013, started taking it at EasyDNS. Um, you know, and then we added like web hosting, VPS, email at EasyDNS. And then under um, lockdowns, I started writing more about economics and finance. I mean, I'd always, I've always had blogs for 20 years, I guess. Uh, and in 2017, I was doing some writing about Bitcoin on Medium. I don't publish on Medium anymore because I, I don't like cancel culture and I don't like their, their habit of deplatforming people who color outside the lines. So I just moved everything over to my my bombthrower.com blog and have been writing from there ever since. And then on, under the lockdowns, I, I started, started doing more investing research. I've always been a lifelong value investor. So I started finding all these little um, micro caps and nano caps. And where I found the most value was in Bitcoin stocks and crypto stocks. So I started writing some reports about those and that became the Crypto Capitalist. It's a premium newsletter. It's still going, but I've renamed it the Bitcoin Capitalist because as clever as I thought the Crypto Capitalist was as a name, uh, because we're, we're in this world of... Um, fashionable Marxism. And I thought uh, crypto capitalist was kind of a neat play on words, but now crypto has this whole other connotation, FTX, Celsius, 3AC, crypto is crap. So I, I rebranded onto the Bitcoin capitalist. And so in the early days of my involvement in all this, I loved everything. I just loved every crypto project because I just, it's all part of a movement and it's all great. And I still do like 
the wider movement because I just think it's the shape of things to come. But I've, I've become more of a maxi for Bitcoin as a monetary protocol. I think Bitcoin is money. Nothing else is money. Uh, Bitcoin is the TCP IP or the Linux of decentralized digital bearer asset money. And everything else is Windows, Oracle, spreadsheets. They're all applications. They're all companies. They're all projects on top of that. Some of them are going to be great. Some of them are going to unlock tremendous value for shareholders. Some of them are going to change the world. And most of them are crap. And that's the same as, as, as it ever was. You're investing in public companies. Most of them are garbage. You've got to tease out those few good ones. The same will be for crypto projects. But Bitcoin is the monetary layer. It's the one thing we can bet on in this day and age. I mean, there's gold and that's a whole separate conversation. And I like gold. I'm a lifelong gold bug. But in terms of like what we're talking about, technology and networks and the internet, it's Bitcoin. Yeah, it's always interesting you know, to listen to the journeys people take. I mean, I used to be, you know, because I didn't understand. We did, we didn't. I didn't. I think most people, you know, that you ask, it's like they didn't have any kind of comprehension. You know, especially if you're not a techie or don't have really the the insights, you know, about like uh, what is a blockchain, what what does decentralization mean, you know. And so I used to be, you know, all these whatever like token stuff and and shit coins and all the ICOs even. But then, you know, it's interesting, like to, and then to find the rabbit hole and then finally understand, like, what, what's the essence of Bitcoin, you know, like, and then uh, eventually it's not, you know, and then it's all about, you know, the, the ethos uh, of, of money or the evolution of money and, and what is really possible to accomplish uh, with, with sound, as, as they call it, you know, sound or scarce as money. Um, yeah. So it's uh, really, Mark, yeah. Sorry. Well, I was just going to say, it's really, it's such a mind shift. It's such an, a, an inversion because Bitcoin is a deflationary, inelastic currency. And 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 people just, the Paul Krugmans of the world just can't wrap their heads around it. And, uh, you know, the deflation is death in the mainstream world. And it is, if you're using debt for money, then deflation is death. But if you're not using debt for money and you're using a hard asset like Bitcoin or like gold, then deflation is actually like, imagine your cost of living goes down over time. Can you imagine a world like that uh, where you could actually shave off some of your, your productive earnings and put them away and have them gain purchasing power over time? What kind of a world would that be? Yeah. You should, uh, because you have your own podcast, Mark, uh, you should definitely have Jeff Boos on your show. Uh, you probably- Oh, I would love to. Yeah. Please, yeah. please contact him. I can, you know, put a word for you. I mean, sure. just contact him directly. I'm sure he's super available. Uh, yeah. He loves to help. And and uh, his book is just mind blowing. It's so simple, like, sim like things that are usually very, not even complex, but maybe, you know, you know, you need like a bigger picture or a comprehension of what is, and the, you know, the title, as it says, the price of tomorrow, why deflation is the key to an abundant future. And yeah. I think we don't even have a, a most people don't have the, uh, the slightest idea or the imagination or comprehension, like what is possible with a defla with a truly scarce and deflationary money, such as Bitcoin. I mean, uh, it could go in any direction with it being a technological, scientific, structural level, even, you know, up to spiritual level, you know, I mean, what, what, yeah. what that could enable humanity. But since we have not grown up, you know, I mean, uh, definitely not my generation, uh, in such a world where uh, not even in a, on a gold standard, we didn't even grow up in a gold standard, right? So we don't even know what it's like to live in a system where we have at least, you know, relatively, uh, as we call, uh, you know, gold uh, is a relatively scarce money, right? Because it yeah. still has an inflation rate. But since Bitcoin is the perfectly predictable money up to the year 2140, uh, it's 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 mind blowing. It's just mind blowing what you know what we could really accomplish on every level we can imagine for humanity and for all the cesspool you know of corruption, systemic theft, and and you know I mean it's just some sometimes unspeakable. And I don't have to tell you this. I mean everything that's going on right now. These are just you know sort of what we see as symptoms. You know, mm -hmm. but the the cesspool of criminality that's been going on, whether we're talking about central banks or the owner controllers of the central bank. This is why I'm so interested. You know in who controls like the issuance of money and like who controls the setting of interest rates, who controls, you know, the central banks of the central banks. Um, but, you know, um, 
it just it's just so much deflection, so much uh, distraction going on. And, uh, you know, they've done really a great job. I was just talking to my girlfriend last night again. It's like they, they've done really an amazing job, like brainwashing, indoctrinating and really distracting humanity for such a long time, at least for decades. Well, what's your what's your take on that? And by the way, your your, your articles are amazing. I just read the the last one. I think you on on Bitcoin about uh, Charles Munger. What, what's his is his, his name? Charles Munger, <laughs> <laughs> the geriatric. I don't know, even that's word. Gerontocracy. Yeah. Yeah. It's that's I mean, Peter Thiel's phrase, but uh, yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. <laughs> well, okay. So a few different things to pack in there. Um, the um and actually just just in the process of losing my train of thought so we can start with the munger article so i mean you know i was i've, I've been a lifelong value investor uh i just like that way of approaching investing it just resonates with me and people always say with value investing you either get it or you don't get it and it's rather unfortunate that uh um People like Warren Buffett and and Charlie Munger are the archetypical grand you know grand poobas of value investing. Even though there are others, in fact, even in this space, like Preston Pish was a you know his whole podcast. We study billionaires. He he was always an espoused value investor, and he became completely orange pilled. And so, it's definitely not um, mutually exclusive to be one or the other. And I know other value investors who are um, heavily into Bitcoin as well. But the, the 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 big gains, the alpha that Buffett and Munger were able to harness and rise and ride for for generations, for decades. There's no doubt in you know in my mind that they're skilled, astute investors. They can do um, these complex valuation calculations on the back of a napkin or in their head, and they can make instantaneous decisions and size up situations uh, very quickly. And they can keep their heads when everyone else are panicking. So that's enabled them to make like um, generational wealth trades, like buying American Express during the salad oil scandal or whatever. So. You know, props to them for that. But where they really um, enhanced the returns is really by riding an inflationary wave up the up a secular super cycle of debt. And they just kind of like got on at the ground floor and they rode it up for for decades and and really played those interest rate cycles like a fiddle. And, uh, you know, would, would any of us do anything different in the same position? I don't know. Um, it, it's, it's sort of like that was that defined that era and that era is now coming to a close because it's one of the things you did say, you know, we don't even know life under sound money. I mean, I was born in 67. The Nixon, the Nixon shock happened when I was four years old. I probably don't even have an awareness of it happening, but most of us alive today, think that uh, inflation is as natural as erosion and tectonic plate shifting, but it's not. It's really an aberration. And it's an aberration that throughout history, if you actually start to research it, it's an aberration that happens towards the end of a fiat currency life cycle. That is so, you know, that's the end of an era. And so we, this period of fiat currency has lasted for 50 years. And so what's happened in the past, though, when a fiat currency is flamed out, there's usually been um, currencies around neighboring countries or whatever that you could sort of flee into, uh, move your assets into different currencies and get a little bit of a hedge there. What's unique and sort of historically defining of this era is it's everywhere. Like every currency is fiat. Every currency is suppressing interest rates for 10, 15 years now, and every currency is in trouble. So there's no fiat currency. You can say, oh, I'm just going to sell my dollars and buy Swiss francs, or I'm going to sell my dollars and buy American dollars. It's like none of that. I mean, it might work in the short term, but long term, every, everyone's headed to the same place, zero. So um that's why we need something like Bitcoin. It's why we need stuff like gold. But I still think Bitcoin has this 
they each bring different things to the equation. But what I like about Bitcoin is just that that um, portability, right? I can just remember twelve words. Right? That's fine. If, I, yeah, totally. if I can get out of, uh, if I can get out of, like, let's say um, everything is like all bets off, like uh, just civil order collapses, boots on the ground. I, I just have to get out of here with the with my skin intact and the clothes on my back. I can go someplace else. Plug in my twelve words. Do you remember? You're you're probably like similar age to me. Do you remember the American Express commercial? I think it used to be where like that guy washes up on a deserted island and all he has is his like yeah. credit card yeah. in his pocket. <laughs> and he slaps it down and he gets yeah, fitted for clothes and they bring yeah. him food. Yeah, it's the same thing for Bitcoin. Like that's what it is, right? You just you know, just this orange uh, B symbol. And it's like, you've got it, you get it all back. And and that's what I like about it. And, you know, I, I unfortunately, I think even if we weren't headed for a global currency cataclysm, I still think people are seeing it more and more. We see it with Silicon Valley Bank right now. So, you know, a bunch of like VC unicorns blow themselves up and the government just very, very quickly, it's like, we're going to go even beyond the FDIC insurability. And we've got to bail these people out because they're hedging. They don't on. call it bailout, right? They don't want to backstop or whatever it is. But yeah. <laughs> but, you know, would the same uh, frantic, you know, intervention have occurred if it was like a farmer's co-op in buttfuck Idaho. I don't know. I tend to not think so, but because it was like a bunch of VCs in Silicon Valley um, unicorn elites, that yeah, you got to get them bailed out. But the public sees that. It's like, well, if you're bailing them out, then when my bank goes, like, you don't really have an excuse not to bail me yeah, out. It's obvious, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and so, and, and I was writing about it for years before I knew the phrase Cantillon effect, right? And I've been trying to articulate it for like from 2000 to maybe 2015 or so. I was trying to describe it. It's like, so this money gets created out of nothing here. And these people around this money get, get to experience it as asset price inflation. And they get to experience it as their wealth increasing. But these people, the further they are out there, they don't experience it as rising asset prices. They experience it as cost of living increases. And I didn't have, a, I didn't know there was a word for it until I somebody just commented in one of my posts. It said Cantillon effect. I'm like, shit, who is this guy? You know, and now I got the book right here. Right. You know, so it's like, okay. What is that? What's it called? Oh, Richard. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. No, right. I'd never first, heard of him until found the two. word, like the the word that I was looking at, it was like Safed and Amuz, who probably know, like uh, the Bitcoin standard or the fiat standard is even much yeah. better than the fiat standard. Uh, he's amazing. I mean, Safed Amuz like really opened up a lot of people's you know minds and eyes and and comprehension processes. I mean, the essence like of what you know, essence of Austrian economics for the first time, because we never, we never ever, you know, were introduced. To the principles, you know, to the ethos of Austrian. But anyway, that's that's the word. That's the first time I found it. I stumbled upon the word yeah. Cantillon of it. Yes. Yeah, and um, Safety's book. I was on another podcast last week. Um, uh, uh, was it Your Life, Your Way? The Karadza brothers out of Hamilton, Ontario. They're real estate guys. Great guys. <laughs> Heavily orange pilled. Right. They're seriously into Bitcoin. And the one guy was talking about how he was reading a book, sitting in the office, and he just, the light bulb went on, and he ran out of the uh, his office down the hall to his brother's office and said, we've got Bitcoin all wrong, and we've <laughs> got to get as much of it as possible. And I just said, that was the safe, you were reading the safety book, weren't you? And he's like, yeah, I was. Oh, so, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> no, no, he, he, I mean, Safed is just amazing. It just, yeah, is. Yeah, but I don't know. Maybe maybe it's his also his background because I mean he all he also says himself like like Lynn Alden you probably you know you know yeah yeah it's like, <clears throat> it's like a different mindset or a different way of the processing things. Like they're all both engineers like from background. Like, I don't know, whatever engineers you know machine engineers or whatever. But I think it's just more rational, more logical, more you know maybe even more ethical. I don't know you know. So. <laughs> yeah, I think any so the skills. Thinking about it, like, what do you need to really grok this? Um, I think a lot of techies get it. They sort of understand that. Engineers get it. Um, 
people who are grounded in history, I mean, get it because you, you sort of see these historical cycles and you understand that every fiat currency has gone to zero, always no exceptions. Um, and including kind of Elio, sorry, uh, Mark, if I, if some, uh, no. uh, because I was just, because before I forget that thought, uh, the train of thought, because we were thinking, we were talking about Warren Buffett or Charles Munger. Yeah, yeah. What do you think about Ray Dalio? I mean, the guy is like super smart, super intelligent, wrote books, but even, you know, even Robert Breedlove tried to, you know, he sent him like a lengthy opinion letter or something like to get him, but he just, I don't know, does he do it intentionally? I mean, he's a cantillionaire, right? Would, would you say yeah. Ray Dalio is a cantillionaire? Yeah, I always get Ray Dalio and Jamie Dimon mixed up, but does it matter in this context? Probably not. Um, but I actually have a couple of Dalio's books, and I, 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 you know, I haven't read them all the way through, but I'm looking through them, and I'm like, uh, you know, there's a, there's a lot here. But it wasn't didn't Dalio at once at one point say he may have to rethink Bitcoin? Yes. Yes, so he was at least open yeah. to reexamining yeah. his premises. Yeah. I won't name names here, but I know a few other like newsletter writers that I've known for close to 30 years that are total gold bugs. And like one of them won't even speak to me anymore because he's like, I can't believe you're into Bitcoin. What? Like, I, can't, really? I can't believe you haven't done any work on Bitcoin. Okay, then you should talk to Lawrence Lepard because he's a gold. Oh, I, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I know Lawrence; he's great. Uh, I've had him on the podcast. I did a show with him and yeah. uh, John Rubino from Dollar Collapse. Um, yeah, Lawrence is great, uh, and uh, met him in person last year in Miami. Hopefully, we'll see him again this year. But um, yeah, so and, and so some people, I mean, that famous Upton St. Clair quote applies in some cases, right? It's impossible to get a man to understand something whose livelihood depends on him not understanding right. it. So that applies obviously to a Jamie Dimon, right? Um, it applies to Warren Buffett and Charlie Munger, right? Um, but, uh, you know, some people have a bit more of an open mind to it. I guess some people, it's just, um, they just, they really, uh, the, like it, it's almost maddening how ignorant the objections are to Bitcoin. So you can have an informed objection to Bitcoin, right? Mm -hmm. Like even you could argue that the people who who forked Bitcoin Cash or who are doing ordinals and inscriptions are like they have these informed objections to the current structure of Bitcoin, and so it's it, it becomes an irreconcilable difference and a fork happens or something like that. I mean, in the case of Bitcoin Cash, not ordinals, you can have these informed um, rejections of Bitcoin <laughs> that may come from, I'm actually trying to think of one and nothing springs to mind, but most of the objections we see today are completely ignorant. It's like, well, Bitcoin is backed by nothing. Okay, tell me what the US dollar is backed by. You know, Bitcoin is a Ponzi scheme. Okay, who are the earlier investors that are being paid out by later investors? Yeah. Like, it's just, you yeah. know... It's it's it's, it's very psych really. either it's it's and or psychological emotional some a combination of I mean I don't know it's it's a lot I think bias and uh, cognitive dissonance or maybe you know as you said what was that beautiful phrase you know when you oh when it's you, yeah yeah it's impossible to get a man to understand something whose livelihood depends on him not understanding it you're yeah. naturally biased right I mean yeah. you gotta be otherwise you lose your empire probably you know well I mean they do realize so. You know, and Lawrence Lepard has that beautiful phrase, right? Fix the money, fix the world. And it's funny because before Bitcoin ever came along, I always was looking at, at what was going on in the world and thinking it's the monetary system. It's the monetary system. There's something wrong with this monetary system. And you have to be kind of primed for Bitcoin, I think. So for me, um, it was a flirtation with digital gold currencies in the early OOs, like e-gold and e-bullion oh, and Phoenix and stuff like oh, really? that. So they, ne they never really made it. Yeah. Um, gold money is still around. They pivoted. They're publicly traded now. They're based out of Toronto here. But, you know, I was already sort of looking for that solution then, and it looked like it could be that. It didn't turn out to be that. So when Bitcoin came along and I've, I saw it, I think, late in 2013 as a tech guy. I, sh I wish I recognized it, saw it earlier. Yeah. 
but it was instant recognition when I saw it. It was like, this, this one could work. And everyone kind of has to go, like some people come from the Austrian economics school, which is like, you know, you might as well be like, you know, a witch doctor in today's day and age, if you're an Austrian school con economist, but you're primed for it when you hit Bitcoin. Like, I don't know if Satoshi really came from that kind of a background or not. Definitely. He must have like fundamental knowledge about Austrian economy. It's, there's no other way around. I don't or it could have been like inevitable discovery. Who yeah. knows? But like, if you're, if you, if you read up on the uh, Austrian school economics and you see Bitcoin, you recognize it instantly. And I don't know many Austrian school economists who are vehemently opposed to Bitcoin. Yeah, There may be some who say, it's not for me because I just don't have the, you know, I don't have the wherewithal or the inclination to do a deep enough dive to understand it enough to allocate it. I can, I can, I can respect that. But, but usually when you come across someone saying that, they'll say, you know, it's not for me, but I wish, you know, good luck to everyone. And, and it looks interesting. It looks promising. I don't see Austrian school economists, the ones that aren't Bitcoiners coming out with like Paul Krugman, like, you know, it's evil. It's an abomination. It's like, you know. I mean, I think Krugman is is the the iconic epitome of the <laughs> Austrian so St. Clair quote, right? Yeah, he's a clown. I mean, yeah. by the way, the title of our episode, I I, I had to uh, st steal it from from your mm. uh, from your blog. I, said, yeah, I, I loved it. It's like blowing up the clown world. It's like, yeah, that's a cool title, blowing up the clown, because <laughs> it's the you yeah. know the Bitcoin is the needle. So uh, yeah, it made sense to me. But anyway. But before we're gonna, you know, go into the sort of, I mean, I was just brainstorming what topics I, I would love to talk to you about, or your opinions, your perspectives, your vision, your, you know, uh, what do you think about like nation state Bitcoin adoption and, and accelerating Bitcoin? You know, um, as you know, we probably, do you know Samson Mao, of, uh, who was also in the block size wars, very prominent figure? He's the CEO of Gen3. So he's, no. Gen3 is, you know, their mission is to accelerate hyper Bitcoinization and, you know, boost a nation state Bitcoin adoption. So I was, okay. I just want to like, you know, like what are your thoughts on, on? Well, yeah, it's interesting. So I first, until quite recently, I thought Bitcoin was going to be um, a form of a uh, emergency money. Uh, I probably tell this story on every podcast I'm on. So apologies if you've heard this one already, but um there's a German expression called Notgeld, which means <laughs> emergency money. Uh, it came out of the Weimar hyperinflation when cities started printing their own script. And every hyperinflation has a Notgeld, right? Uh, in, in Zimbabwe, it was prepaid phone cards and gas cards. And because of what we were talking about earlier on, how um, this this time high inf like fiat currencies destroying themselves is happening globally, not locally, uh, I thought Bitcoin was the emergent Notgeld for a global hyperinflationary event. But I thought people who were talking about nation state adoption or central bank adoption were, were bonkers. I thought you're delusional. This will never happen because it would require central bankers to admit they were wrong. And that's just simply never going to happen. However, uh, it all changed on a dime last year, about a year ago, when uh, here in Canada, during the Freedom Convoy, the government started seizing bank accounts of citizens for doing perfectly, undertaking perfectly legal activities, um, even whether you argue whether the protest in Ottawa was legal or not, seizing those bank accounts was over the line, and then seizing the bank accounts of people who crowdfunded it was totally over the line, and that, I believe, was the shot heard around the world. Like back up a few years, I always said the Cyprus bail-in was what put Bitcoin above $100 for the first time. So now you've got governments of a supposedly enlightened liberal democracy seizing bank accounts for wrong think. That, that changes the equation as well. And then within a few months, you had the United States seizing the foreign currency reserves of two sovereign nations. It doesn't really matter what what transgressions they did to deserve that. 
um because i by no means endorse you know the the regime in afghanistan for sure but the fact is is that changes the calculus for everyone involved right so all sovereigns are now saying so wait a minute this pile of debt that's backed by nothing can now be taken away from me at the stroke of a pen or the press of a button so suddenly it made me realize that you know that acronym right there is no other alternative like uh tnona or whatever this has to happen and I wrote an article a while ago, a few years ago, that said, you know, if Bitcoin didn't exist, we'd have to invent it right now. Well, thank God it's been invented already. And a lot of the kinks have been ironed out. And it's been running along for, what is it now, like 14 years. Um, at least we have that runway now. I may have to take this call. I'm going to mute for one second. It'll take me 30 seconds, okay? Yeah, sure. Yeah, I'll go on a rant. <laughs> I'm going to use this time while uh, Mark is on the phone. Um, he he is the audio producer of uh, Whitney Webb's uh, two volume books, uh, One Nation on the Blackmail. You should definitely read those both books, which, uh, by the way, I think the second part, uh, the second uh Part is much more thrilling, much more, I mean, much more deeper and 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 thrilling. And um yeah, Mark, are you are you done with your phone? Call? I'm back and I even Just remember my phone. Advertising. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, I appreciate that. No, I had well, to take that but, call. But, listen, um, I mean, Mark, we need to talk about like I really want to because you see, you seem to be you make a very wise impression and you seem to be have a, a little more of a bigger picture and more interest in your open-mindedness. I mean, since you're the audio producer of Whitney Webb's uh, One Nation on the Blackmail, and you know, I love Whitney Webb. She's one of the rarest, what do you call it, species, almost extinct species of real, true investigative journalism, as I, as I always say, you know? Yeah. Like, and I I'm, I mean, I'm still waiting for her for feedback to get on my show, but because I'm, I have some specific questions, because like how fucked up, how blackmailed is the system really? I mean, going down not only to the judicial, uh, uh, you know, going down to the judicial, legislative, executive branch, like, like worldwide, globally, like what kind of decision makers in key positions are being or have been blackmailed? It's uh, almost mind numbing to think about it. Yeah. Uh, I've suspected for a number of years uh, that I don't think, I think the system, the way it's constructed right now, you are not permitted to rise in that system unless there is, you know, some kind of formal or informal control file around you. Exactly. And that creates some perverse incentives where, um, you know, one of my favorite quotes of all time is in the Sovereign Individual book, where they say, um, too little attention has been paid to the fact that electoral politics lures disordered messianic personalities into positions of power. I just thought that so sums up our system. And so you get these types of people attracted to positions of power. You only rise in that system if there is some sort of compromat about you. You can only have compromat about you if you're willing to um, lower your moral threshold. Um, sorry, hang on a sec. I'm just coordinating with this contractor who's on his way over. Sure, no problem. Um, so anyhow, and you only have to, you you have to, you can only have compromise about you, right? You can only be blackmailed if you are willing to lower your moral standards to have something blackmailable, right? And or so you moved into that system. You know what I mean? Because um, I yeah. think lots of people, they're not naive. They're not stupid. They're just being, I mean, they know what they're going to deal with. Uh, they know they're going to get all the, whatever, the wealth, the money, the power, whatever they, they're desiring, but they know they got to sell their, whatever, their ethos, their soul, their morals, you know? Uh, yeah. Yeah. And so um, the kinds of people who would be really capable or um, competent in positions of power actually have incentives structured such that it's better for them not to enter that kind of um, that that trajectory. Uh, there was a there was a Canadian cartoonist many many years ago named Ben Wicks. I think he was a English um, 
Emegre who came here and he had these like really irreverent and witty cartoons, a lot of them political. And I remember one from when I was a kid saying, you know, there's some headline on the TV and this father's talking to his kid. He says, son, the people intelligent enough to run a country are too, are too smart to get into politics. Right. And it was some, you know, typical Canadian scandal in those days. It was like tuna fish scandal. I remember the tuna fish scandal when I was a kid, which is like pretty lightweight compared to now. But so I think what I like about Bitcoin is it it, it shows us a direction where we can we can build a new alternative system. I don't think the system it kind of comes back to what we were talking about before my phone rang. I don't really see the existing system embracing Bitcoin in any um, meaningful way, maybe in a symbolic way. I mean, Bitcoin is already like the the new BIS guidelines allow banks to have up to 2% actually Bitcoin as uh, tier one reserves. And right. uh, and then and then I think some other, I think 1% of, of non-Bitcoin uh, crypto. That's a huge shift, right? Mm-hmm. And that's kind of in the fine print. And, and, and I think that's more of a, a nod from existing systems that this is not going away and we know it's not going away, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's here for good. Um, I remember my wife is from Barbados and I was stunned that um, one of the governors uh, to the Barbados Central Bank wrote a paper in like 2017 saying uh, we should think about holding 1% of our foreign asset reserves in Bitcoin. This is like 2016, 2017 out of Barbados, right? Um, so there are some people thinking about it, but then what happened last year, like I said, made me realize this is going to be more than than note guilt. This is going to be more than just emergency money that that the plebs flock to as currencies go to zero. This probably there's going to be some kind of monetary reset. I don't know how successful it's going to be, but there will probably be some kind of component in it. I'm guessing, okay, we're going to do, we're going to reconstitute these following currencies. We're going to put in um, some sort of uh, natural resource component. We'll put in some gold. We'll put in some Bitcoin where it's going to be like this. It'll be a SDR. I have no idea. I really don't know. There's going to be a lot of jockeying for position and stuff. But, you know, we get through this geopolitical tension we're in now without World War III breaking out or it does break out or if it has broken out we sort of get through without blowing up the world we're still going to have to trade with each other afterwards right we're still going to have to like you know we're still so tightly coupled with all of our economies and that's actually a good thing i think that um there's going to be an admission all the way around it's like we may not like or trust each other so we need trust we need some sort of trustless settlement layer so we can at least trade each other trade with each other and maybe do more of that and less of fighting with each other. So what's, uh, I mean, since you talked about like the, the, the this, this, this insane, I mean, uh, thought of like triggering a world. I mean, it seems they want a war. I mean, wherever, whether it's a psyop, a false flag or, or, or just instigation or provocation, uh, what's your take? I mean, is that, is the system so already so overblown or like we're too quadrillion including derivatives and from the liabilities. Is that the reason? I mean, I mean look, just look at all the sim- symptoms. Uh, these are just minor symptoms, I think, you know, but yeah. are, do you think we are in this gradual and sudden moment uh, soon or are we already in it? Uh, you know, um, Pippa Malmgren, um, I've read her blog from time to time and she's got this expression that we're in world war three already and she calls it hot wars in cold places right and so we have this battle going on in the ukraine uh it's a proxy war and she says but there's a lot of it that's ha-. she was talking about this a year before the ukraine invasion happened and she said you know like China is flinging satellites into deep space, like someone's cutting uh, data cables deep under sea. Um, in the US and North America, there's this spat of, of um, food processing plant explosions. Now, I don't know, I don't know what state actors, I don't know what's what's 
echo terrorists, who knows what any of this stuff is. It's just kind of a general, um, I call it the jackpot after William Gibson novel, right? Um, just this sort of like long uh, rolling crises that just never stop rolling. Um, if we're in World War III already, that actually might be an indicator that every world war uh, has been a little less kinetic than the one before. Like World War I was just a meat grinder. It was awful, right? World War II, also bigger kill count and all that stuff. So that was pretty bad. I don't mean to underplay it by saying pretty bad, but if we're in a World War III now and it's mainly being fought in in deep space and under the sea and in computer networks, then then maybe that's not a terrible thing. Uh, maybe it's as good as it gets for World War III. And and the 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 more you know, the less kinetic hand to hand conflict we have, the better. I hope the Ukraine situation resolves itself soon. I hope Yemen resolves itself soon. I hope just everyone sort of gets back to this sort of like maybe different form of um, globalism where where there's this realization that it's better to trade with each other than fight with each other. Um, and I think if, if we get to that point, we're going to need some sort of neutral bearer asset to, to act as a settlement layer. And, you know, I think Bitcoin at least has a role in there. Mm-hmm. Um, wh- what I'm curious about, um, you know, El Salvador, I mean, <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, it, it's legal. T- I mean, just looking at the the transformational changes, the safety has come back. The people are coming by the expat sort of the the people are even coming internationally from Canada to to yeah. permanently. What, what what's your thought on that? What's your position? And do you think there is going to be like a critical mass of El Salvador like countries, whether it be Latin America and or Africa? That just tips it. It just it just it just accelerates a chain chain reaction of whatever that is, you know, sort of a transformational change or nation state bit kind of And then it's and it's over, you know. Then it's then it, exactly what's maybe Buckminster Fuller, uh, what's his name? Yeah, Buckminster Fuller says, you know, we don't need to fight the system, but to create new ones and yeah. make the old uh, system obsolete. Yeah, I mean, when El Salvador declared. Bitcoin to be legal tender, a, a really priceless meme came out that said, said sort of, you know, timeline of Bitcoin, right? Like, uh, I'm, I, I won't get it right, but it's like 2008, only crazies use it. 2009, only drug dealers use it. 2010, only, you know, small companies use it. 2000, whatever, whatever. Finally, like 2020, only small countries use it, right? And it was just going up the scale. And so since then, of course, Central African Republic has also declared Bitcoin to be legal tender, which is part of that French. Yeah, that happened like last year still. Yeah, no, but they went on a shit coin on a, uh, some kind of, they, 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 I think they withdrew the position. They, they, they went into shit coin, Central African Did Republic. They? Yeah, yeah, they did. I go, did not know that. Oh, they, they, they fucked up, to be honest with you. And really, oh, that's too bad. Uh, but, uh, you know. And then we'll. Tonga as well, but then yeah. like the last I heard, and then suddenly the earthquake hit, right? Yeah. And so that and that that sort of all bets were off, and they're just working on reestablishing connectivity and 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 that kind of thing. So, but it is happening, and um, you know, I think like fiat, no matter what, is doomed, and I think everybody knows it. I think even the central banks know it. That's why we have this. They're driving hard to the hoop for central bank digital currencies. Exactly. Yeah. And I've been saying I don't know if they're gonna. I, the system is unploding is imploding so fast that um, I don't know if they're gonna get it out in time before the system collapses. But I think some sort of CBDC, stable coin, hybrid, and then. <clears throat> cryptos around the edge and then bitcoin in there um i think it's all gonna i think we're kind of headed for this balkanization of money and uh <clears throat> and i think there will be more countries kind of going to this i think what could happen uh you could see u.s states you know enshrining bitcoin in their economies and not the country doing so and that can lead to some friction and some tensions as well or secession <laughs> or so, yeah i mean well Essentially, my understanding of the U.S., uh, the structure of that country has has grown over the years. And I think, like, technically speaking, on paper, like, the states are 
are able to do this. It's, yeah. They're well within their rights to do this because they're all sovereigns, right? It's the United States. Um, and so they have the ability to do this. Uh, how it plays out in Canada, hard to say. Uh, other than I just know that there's more Bitcoin uptake happening in Canada, more companies are looking at taking it. I think Lightning's a huge catalyst, right? I think Lightning is going to just get people used to just like buying a coffee with with Sats. Yeah. So what 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 is I mean? Um, so what we're seeing is that you know the dictatorial measures they're trying to take, you know, with the WHO like <laughs> taking over the. I don't know what, you know, like uh, uh, declaring uh, pandemic or whatever international concern, whatever it's called, like this mm -hmm. is the plan. This is the agenda. I mean, it's in the open. It's not even a conspiracy theory. They they want this, you know, and it's uh, what, what I find really uh, uh, mind boggling is that so few people like us, you know, like talk about it or uh, trying to, you know, alert people to the fact that this is an ongoing process or the intention is behind it. Uh, so I think they're trying to put all these pieces into 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 place, into position to roll out, you know, and then it comes. Uh, but I think they're going to fail. I mean, it's, I'm not the only one. I think a lot of prominent Bitcoin say they're going to try it, but then they're going to fail because the pain point by that time is going to be so high that uh, they will just switch automatically, naturally to Bitcoin because they just see it. It's, a you know, as you said in the beginning, it's a deflationary money. That's the only decentralized, non-confiscatable you know, immutable, scarcest money you can't, you know, you can't take away. So, um, yeah, what do you think? I mean, is is well, that what I mean? Think? I mean, I think of these things more as incentives and dynamics than like conspiracies and overarching plans. And, and it's perfectly understandable that uh, the relics of the industrial age era want to centralize as much as possible. And, and the, the thought of things not being under control are terrifying to them. But they'll get to a point, the world will get to a point where we realize collectively at different speeds that we are not in control. We live in an out of control world and the magic happens in decentralization and having shock absorbers, not centralized control. That's the only way to navigate difficult situations. And so what we're seeing and, and enough people already know this and i think in this way i am actually a little thankful for the pandemic because it took i always say it took 20 years of creeping authoritarianism and it compacted it into 18 months and that was too much too soon for a lot of people and so they kind of woke up and said this is the direction everything's going and i don't like this direction and it doesn't even work like it doesn't that's the key point in all of this it doesn't work. If it worked, we'd have a lot to worry about. It's yeah. like if the trains ran on time and the economy flowed frictionlessly and, and there was plenty and abundance and health, everyone would be, well, how do you compete with that? We've got yeah. this Bitcoin over here. And it's like, yeah, but my life is going just great. But that's not the situation. It doesn't work. It's just that's why we have the clown world. And um, and and so the, the incentives are such that people will just gravitate to these other systems. And everywhere we've seen a CBDC launch, we haven't seen a successful one yet. Exactly. Nigeria is a shit show, right? <laughs> Venezuela, they're on their second round of, um, of CBDC. And every time they launch one, they have to knock like six zeros off their currency. So it's just even China's uh digital one when they launched it at the olympics was kind of ho-hum reception mm -hmm. in the most totalitarian regime on earth next to maybe north korea so people were still saying you know what what i get on my uh my we we chat is better than what this this government put out so yeah. um we we haven't seen a cbdc fly yet and um the incentives are such that uh i just don't think like let me let me get this straight you're going to like send me free money on my phone every month. Yay. I have to spend it by the end of the month. Mm, okay. I don't save anyway. Uh, okay. And then fast forward three years and now it's going to like count. It's going to meter my carbon footprint. Exactly. Mm, I don't know. And if I post the wrong thing on Twitter, they're going to take some out. Yeah. Okay. If that's or, slavery, I don't know what it is. <laughs> yeah. Or I can, I can have this. 
right? And I can say, think, drink, eat, go anywhere I want. There's not a damn thing anybody can do about it. Yeah. What are the choices, right? Yeah. And, then, and hey, look, and Mark, I mean, look at the practical, look at the rate of speed of development within the Bitcoin uh, technology infrastructure, I would call it. Would it be lightning, liquid as a side chain? I mean, it's, the mm -hmm. game is over. It's it's like so fast, the development. I mean, we're yeah. going to probably have each one of us like a little mini satellite. I mean, look at Blockstream. They are, I mean, they're already, it's already working. You know, maybe yeah. it's, it's going to be more pop, more compact, more e user-friendly, easier to use, cheaper, deflationary, you know. I mean, and we're going to be decentralized, even the communication systems, you know, I mean, look at uh, what is it called, like a Nostra, a Keat, uh, by the same guy, you know, who, uh, who who brought out like Tether, right, like USDT, it's the same yeah. guy, right, uh, uh, what's his name, Paolo Arduino, right, it's a totally decentralized communication platform, yeah. so... I think the cat is off the bag. What do you think, uh, Mike? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Like, I mean, I, I got past the crypto, or I, I still use crypto to describe the whole space, but I still got past, I've been past the it's here to stay point for a long time. Like, this just isn't going anywhere. Um, you drive down the street, you see corner stores with buy Bitcoin signs in the window right um i'm going to costa rica next week and apparently like you can buy like fruit from the from the cabanas and bitcoin there in some oh, places so mm -hmm. yeah it's 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 happening i really um it's going to be a turbulent time but it's you know it's it's that really powerful phrase right it's an idea whose time has come we're heading into our what is it our third financial crisis since the year 2000 um if you count the dot-com crash and we've seen the same tired policies just widening the wealth inequality just rewarding the incompetent doubling down on failure and i think because of the pandemic response people are have really woken up now and yeah. i really don't think they're going to put up with yeah. it and i think i think they're making their they're not there's not going to be pitchforks and torches in the street it's just people are just like yeah i'm just i've got staff like you know i've i've, I've got people on my team who are taking some of their paycheck in bitcoin now and um you know and it's happening across the political spectrum it's happening across all identity and group divisions like everybody everybody is moving into this into this because it's just it's rational self-interest economically yeah i'm gonna have to wrap i like he's not here yet but i got like maybe a couple more minutes and then we're yeah gonna yeah to... no but no i was just gonna wrap it up uh but i was just gonna say because i mean you touched upon the topic like uh, what uh the, the you know the whole uh the collateral damages, the, the direct, indirect damage, destruction of livelihoods, you know, COVID or the so-called vaccines, and now the politicians or the puppets, uh, puppeteer, whatever, puppet decision makers now trying to save their asses and, you know, and trying to relative, relativize, you know, their statements like, oh, we we could have, we, sh we, we didn't know at that time, but it's all now in the open. It's become so obvious. It's. Uh, it's it's mind mind boggling the, the 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 scope and the extent of of the damages and the deaths that has occurred that yeah, alone yeah. by itself i mean we haven't seen nothing yet i think in the next three to five years um and there's these are experts who are saying this it's like a lot of people are gonna die you know would it be you know tuba uh, cancers or all kinds of diseases coming you know or uh, you know what i'm saying like uh so this is i think this this has accelerated the awakening process i agree with you it's great meeting you i gotta go because okay my guy mark thank okay. you so much and i hope we can continue this next time Bye. yeah we'll go we'll go longer next time and i'm sorry yeah. to ring off so abruptly yeah and make a make a threesome discussion all right mark bye okay Thanks take so care bye. okay, okay.